Welcome to Wellness Wednesdays. I'm Penny Radostitz and the lovely Dr. Jody Santarosa is going to be presenting most of this talk. I'll put my two cents worth in if she wants me to, but uh, um, sadly we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. Um, Dr. Santarosa can't hear any of us, but we can hear her. So that's all that really matters. Um, so if you do have a question, just put it in the chat and I will, uh, I've got her on the speakerphone on the side here and I will, um, uh, relay the question and we'll unmute you for that portion. Um, for the moment, I'm going to mute everybody because we need to be able to, um, you know, do this without distraction. I'm going to unmute Dr. Santa Rosa though because we need her. And um, <clears throat> Jody tells me she can't hear me. So uh, I'm just going to revert here to Connie for a second. Uh, could all right, love technology. <clears throat> um, would someone please send me a message in the chat if you can't hear me? Of course, if you can't, you won't be able to send me a chat. But okay, Connie says she can hear me. Excellent. We're ready. <laughs> Anybody else? So I think. I'm just gonna admit this one here. Okay, I think we're good. Rob says he can hear us, so everybody's everybody's good. So go ahead, Dr. Santa Rosa. Oh, I can't hear anyone. Oh, well, that's you. Okay, it's a it's okay, Jody. You don't need to hear. I don't need to hear. Just so yeah. everyone else can hear, I will send you questions. So Perfect. Saying. Yeah. Okay, go for it. All right, welcome to uh, our second last of our wellness webinars. We're always glad you can join us. And <clears throat> just for a little fun, I, I can't hear any of you, but I understand y'all can hear me and I'll try to watch the chat. If anyone uh, has any, any questions as we go through, Penny will be uh, moderating and she, she can reach out. Um, so we are talking today about crooked legged foals. It's a quote unquote kind of a rehab perspective and uh, Penny and I are happy to bring this to you on behalf of the rehab department Delaney Vet Services. So whenever I plan one of these little chats or webinars, I always like to just do a literature search to see what might be new or what I might have missed. And when I did the literature, literature search this time, I came upon this report which detailed a collaborative effort among four professionals. And the, the patient in, in question was a donkey foal who was noted for being standing upright. Uh, he had decreased weight bearing on the heels and he had a loss of a normal hoof angle. Now this is not him, but this is a relatively good example of what they're describing. And we'll get to this a little bit later, but this is something we would describe as a flectoral um, deformity and, and, and a contracture. We can see here this fetlock is hyperflexed and we can see his heel is coming off the ground. So with this little donkey, a group of folks decided to take a team approach and really it came from this idea that occupational therapists and physiotherapists routinely see human patients with a wide variety of musculoskeletal and neuromuscular conditions. Um, and this this begets that whole conversation of what about animal physiotherapy? And the, the situation is different from place to place. For example, in North America, we don't have a formally trained program for quote unquote animal physiotherapists. That's a protected human term. So we may be rehab practitioners. Uh, whereas elsewhere, for example, in the UK, there are actually animal physiotherapists. So there's an entire professional designation which does not exist there. Uh, so certainly the collaboration between different professionals of different backgrounds um, has really synergistic effects and we can see more and more the integration of rehab practice into veterinary medicine uh, really globally. So this particular case involved a veterinarian, an occupational therapist, a physiotherapist and a farrier. And so together these professionals collaborated and they devised a treatment scheme which included dietary changes, uh, serial shoeing supports, we'll have, see some examples of that a little bit later, postural correction uh, in terms of some muscle work and exercises, casting, soft tissue stretching, 
and other controlled exercises. Ultimately, the, the outcome for this little dude was positive. The thing that drew my attention to this, if you all can, can see, this was 30 years ago. 30 years ago in the Canadian Vet Journal, a group of folks got together and that may have been really the, the first time um, that anything like this was published in the Canadian literature to that point. So I guess I find it interesting that 30 years ago we were starting, um, but yet here we are 30 years later and we're not doing it in every case. But this is, uh, you know, where being part of a greater team is really a benefit and having an opportunity to integrate. Though Penny and I have come from an animal health background, myself as a veterinarian and herself as an animal health technologist, in this situation, we're really coming to the table as rehab practitioners. Um, so we want to just take a moment here to highlight Dr. Sanchez. Um, he gave me the idea ultimately for this talk last year, whether he knew it or not. Um, but he presented a phenomenal review of uh, angular limb deformities in the foal called That Doesn't Look Right, Foal Limb Deformities. Um, and you can see Dr. Sanchez is uh, quite a, quite a happy-go-lucky kind of guy. So he, he shared his presentation with, uh, with me and I've incorporated a little bit of his information. Um, certainly we have similar but different, different approaches, um, but I think the best case for all of our patients is that our approach is collaborative. So we're glad to have him on our team and uh, appreciate him sharing his work. Um, so I think the dream in any moment where we all decide, you know, we're gonna embark on this breeding journey and reach out to see what this next generation can look like. I think this is what we have in mind. This was certainly what I had in mind the first time I bred my thoroughbred mare was a chestnut stud colt like this. And it is what I got, um, I was fortunate. But however, sometimes this is the reality. And so we can see various presentations. We can see an angular limb deformity here, something similar happening here. And it looks like real laxity in this foal. And these are just examples of some of the ways that these legs can be crooked. So if you, you go out and you see this, I mean, first of all, I think that we're fortunate when these foals can be born normally, sometimes particularly with the contractures, even foaling can be difficult. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through as well. So now you have a foal and maybe your foal started straight and this is something that has evolved as they've gotten older. Truly, maybe they came out of the incubator looking just like this. We'd like this leg to come obviously right down here if you all can see that pointer. Um, and so when you see this, the very first thing we need to do is we need to reach a diagnosis. And I can't emphasize enough how key early intervention is. There are a number of things that can be happening that are creating this, we call valgus deformity. So this goes out to the lateral aspect. This valgus deformity, there are a number of, of issues that could be causing that. And so we need to determine what they are, but doing so in a very timely fashion will have a major impact on the long-term abil athletic ability or even soundness. And so that first step is the diagnosis. And typically we, this is where we do need a veterinarian involved in this because we really need radiographs. Um, as rehab practitioners, we can do visual exams, we can palpate that, we can watch them walk, we can take photos, we can do a number of things, but radiographs are key to long-term success. Now, when we palpate this, one of the little stress tests we do is to determine, is this leg going this way because the soft tissue around the joint isn't able to hold it in? Or is there actually a bony deformation in here? And what we do is called a stress test. We'll put one hand on the inside of this joint, put the other hand on the toe and we'll pull. And if that leg straightens, we know we're dealing with a soft tissue issue. If that leg, well, potentially a soft tissue issue, there's, there's an exception to that and I'll wait for it. And this comes back to radiographs. If it doesn't move, it's more likely that we have a bony abnormality that's creating that. The other thing to be cognizant of in these foals are concurrent conditions. And what I mean by that is, you know, most of these little guys look like they've 
got up and they've nursed and they're, they're doing pretty good. Some of these foals that are born with severe contractures can't even get up to nurse. And so now we may have a failure of passive transfer. We may have a septic joint. We may have an infected umbilicus. And so we need to be very conscientious of what other conditions may be affecting our patient. In addition to our veterinary diagnosis, we will look at a rehab consultation. So this is an example of a foal who really didn't come out as functional, likely, as the others. Maybe had some contracture, didn't get up, may have gotten dehydrated. So some of what we're seeing are healthy foals and some of what we're seeing are foals that are truly recumbent and may have additional medical considerations, as I said. So the necessity and the importance of a full assessment and exam is very important. And generating then a problem list. What are the things that we need to deal with? And any time we're thinking about a full, we need to be very conscientious of pain control and ulcer support. We know in general that horses um, are susceptible to gastric ulcers and foals seem to be a factory, especially when they're young and when they're stressed. The other purposes of the rehab consult are really to say, what are the goals of therapy? There are some times that we are very cognizant that rehab is not the first call on this case. We need to go to the surgery suite. And so we need to have a realistic, very practical discussion of what the goals are of therapy. And then we look at what therapies may be best selected for this case and then execution. As I say, with all rehab cases, rehab perspectives will work, but somebody has to do the work. Um, and one of the other real cornerstones of the rehab practice that we've, we've talked about before is this idea of objective measurements. What is a non-biased way, non-subjective way that we know that we are achieving our goals of therapy? And we'll talk about that as well as we go through. So in general, and this was, you know, kind of the beauty of having the opportunity to, to put together this webinar, was that a chance to review, as I said, some of the things that have been happening, get caught up in a few webinars. And there's a very emergent field specifically devoted to ne neonatal physiotherapy. Um, and some of this re research is coming out of Helsinki, Finland. And it is by a PhD physiotherapist who works in conjunction with the veterinary college there. But they're talking about concepts that are just really phenomenal to me. Um, about this concept of normal full ataxia. There's some degree of drunkenness apparent, you know, in the first apparent about three to four weeks. This concept that we may have heard of before called laterality, our horse is right or left handed. We believe there's this idea that they are in fact ambidextrous at birth, but very shortly after they develop a laterality. So a preference for one side or the other. And it's very interesting because some of the ways they're measuring that are truly looking at the sides of the full nurses off the mare equally. Um, there's some other factors there too that go back to the eye that the mare and the foal want to keep dominant, which is usually their left eye. Um, they're also looking at different progressions of normal motor control in foals. So it, it was, it's very interesting. And there's going to be, from what I heard in some of these webinars, I had an opportunity to attend today, uh, a lot of research coming out in this field. So in general, with neonatal physiotherapy or rehabilitation therapy here in Canada, uh, we need to consider the mare. So, you know, this this is a foal. There's probably a mare standing sedated, maybe, if she wants to bite or kick or strike, or maybe standing quietly. So I think safety first is a really important consideration when we're working, especially with these recumbent sick little dudes. You never know the second that one of them will all of a sudden shoot out a back leg and knock out your two front teeth. And you can ask uh, one of our interns. She didn't lose her teeth, but she did have a fat lip. We also need to consider a special hygienic or aseptic consideration when we're, we are working with these little guys, thinking that, again, their umbilicus may be open. They may have had a septic joint. Um, they may have a compromised immunity. And if we aren't very conscientious of our own hygiene, we could be potentially succumbing them to some other infection or septicemia. And that's one of the biggest cautions in general. So. I often tell students or interns or clients, it's great that you know what to do, when to do it, but you know when not to do and not to do it. And so certainly cautions and in, in evoking physiotherapy, rehabilitation therapy principles and foals or any indications of septicemia, uh, some bladder related conditions um, and respiratory disease. 
the really key thing in general for physiotherapy and specifically as it relates to foals so there's no single plan for a single foal i mean we may have a very similar anatomical presentation but this foal might have a ruptured bladder the next one might have a septic joint the one after that may have had oxygen deprivation at birth so we really need to be meticulous in our formulation of the plan so talking a little bit about objective measurements, uh, sequential radiographs are really the, the key in terms of angular limb deformities and some, to some degree flexural abnormalities as well. In addition to allowing us that progress over time, it allows us to usually note the cause of deviation. So just to orientate you to these radiographs, these are the front legs of a horse. This is the carpus. And so you can imagine we are basically standing in front of the foal and taking the x-ray from front to back. What we see here is this black line. This, is the, this whole bone is the radius and it comes into the carpal or the knee joint, the front knee because there's a back knee. And we have here this blackish line and this is the growth plate. We can also see here these little square bones in the carpus. We have a, two rows of what we call cuboidal bones, and they're, they're little cubes, essentially, and their job is to impact force. Hopefully, you have a functional foot, and so most of that ground force reaction is being resorbed in that foot, and if it's not, this is the next place where these structures absorb force. These start to ossify in birth in utero before birth and we'll talk a little bit about this as we go through different causes of angular limb deformity sometimes for a variety of reasons these bones may not be formed so our x-ray becomes a diagnosis not just an objective measurement further sometimes we can see issues in the growth plate so inflammation or something we call fasciitis or specifically fractures of the growth plate which have their own entire classification system. Uh, but what we usually do is when we're measuring these is we imagine the center axis of this radius and we come down and we draw a line right through it. And then we come through our distal cannon bone and we draw another line right through this. That angle tells us the degree of deviation and that is important not only for determining which treatment, but as we say, to be able to really qualify how our treatments are improving. So just to give you a little schematic again of what's happening here. So here's our foal and we can see again, this is a common deviation. He comes through the carpus and he has what we call a valgus. So he comes out to the outside. And you can see here in this schematic how the bone on this side is essentially growing more quickly and forcing this down while compressing these bones. This pathology can truly happen in any hinge joint. So we see it commonly in the carpus, occasionally in the hocks, and in the fetlocks. Typically it's a front end, but it can occur in any of the lower joints on any limb. And the one other thing I want to draw your attention to, and we're going to revisit this again, is this idea how on this side we have a certain concavity, and on this side we have a certain convexity. The convex surface is the surface that is essentially having accelerated growth. The concave surface is the surface that is having delayed growth and that will influence our treatment choices as we go on. So you've heard me refer a little bit to the terms valgus, that might be hard to read, it's V-A-L-G-U-S or varus, V-A-R-U-S. And these are two uh, the two differentiations really of angular limb deformities. And when we speak about angular limb deformities, we're really talking about a bony change. And so we can just see this valgus deformation, the leg goes out, the toe splays out, some may say. Or in this deviation going towards the middle, sometimes we call it a pigeon toe. And these are the most two most common presentations. The most common presentation is what we refer to as carpal valgus. And so that's a, some of the examples I've provided. Um, and it, there's in fact belief that up to about 5% 
or five degrees of deviation is normal, um, maybe as they grow older. And of course it comes back to that front limb being attached only by soft tissue and the pecs. You can see sometimes as foals grow, they'll kind of just turn in naturally. There's mild classifications of deviation, which range between five and 10 degrees, moderate between 10 to 20, and severe is greater than 20. And I wanna just acknowledge here that our current belief and I am going to emphasize that word current because there's some interesting, there's one very interesting study I'm going to talk about a little bit later with kinesiology tape. But our current belief is that virtually all of these foals that have a deviation of greater than 20 degrees will need some type of surgery. And although we're talking rehab, we'll still mention some of those surgeries just, just for completeness. Sometimes mild to moderate cases may spontaneously resolve within four weeks. And that goes back a little bit to this idea that is coming out of Helsinki about foals have a normal degree of ataxidness or handedness. They're just trying to get into understanding how they have four independent limbs that kind of steer. Now, it's very important to say here that the degree there that the spont the spont this spontaneous recoveries really depend on that cause of deformity. Now, this is a cause of deformity that is absolutely not going to resolve spontaneously. It will resolve in time. So when we talk about, again, angular limb deformities and the causes, we have a group to which we refer as congenital. So meaning associated with birth, around birth, or birth that way, essentially. And there's perinatal as well, another term I use. But a common finding we'll see is what we refer to as incomplete ossification. So again, if you remember that first drag you saw, and you can see this is a progression of this. So you can imagine, you go out and you look at your foal, you can't see these bones, or this kind of looks like Fred Flintstone, two eyes, a mustache, see the hair? Okay, anyway, I'll stop, I'm glad I can't hear Penny. Um, <laughs> but so, you know, you go out and you see this foal has a crooked leg, and you think, oh, he'll just, he'll straighten up, it'll be, it'll be okay. And we just, you know, maybe do conservative with that, or maybe that foal is on pasture already. But this is where the radiograph is key. If you take this picture and you see this, these bones have not turned into bone. They're still in a developmental stage of becoming ossified or mineralized, having that hard um, minerals deposited to actually make a bone from a cartilage base. And this is a foal a short time later, and you can see these bones do fill in. The critical issue here is if this foal goes out and runs and plays, he, she may damage these beyond a point of repair. Once we have damaged these cells that produce the bone from the cartilage, we aren't able to repair that. And you will occasionally see foals and you just, or horses, and you look at them and you think, man, you must have had you know, and I think in my head of what that thing probably had as a baby, but likely uh, something like this. So why do these things happen? Um, there are a number of factors. Certainly we look at uh, mare factors. So because this is dependent on just general health and vasculature, I do have a slide I'll show you a little bit about the blood supply. Uh, sometimes we think about blood supply as the little arteries and veins that we can see in our hands or the ones that we can feel pulses, but sometimes the most important blood, blood vessels are the ones that are about one cell layer thick and they're just a tiny spider web of a pat pattern that nourish those bones and allow them to form. So if there is some disruption in blood supply during birth, so a placentitis, um, some kind of inflammation or infection in the placenta, the oxygen, the blood flow to the foal may be affected. Other metabolic diseases that the mare may have, um, she has Cushing's disease and is ill, or maybe if she's insulin resistant and is ill and not well controlled, maybe she has pneumonia or COPD, underlying disease, parasites, colic, anything that will really disrupt her system in such a way that her body essentially gets the message, hey, we, we might not make it, we need to conserve our blood flow. Uh, to this foal and they may not be able to ossify completely. Premature birth, so sometimes uh, these little guys just don't have enough time in the oven essentially. Uh, twins virtually always have this dismaturity or this uh, lack of ossification and dismature foals. So you may have heard before we talk about these hyperthyroid foals um, that have the jaw issues as well. 
often they'll have accompanying uh, incomplete ossification. Uh, other causes of angular limb deformity, different kind of perinatal factors are periarticular laxities. So in this foal, does he not have cuboidal bones? Does he not have tendon or ligament support? Is this truly bony? Um, I don't know, this is not my picture and I don't have radiographs to go, but when I look at this, I really suspect when I push this back, I get the impression that this is, is a periarticular tendon laxity. The issue with these is they may be accompanied by cuboidal bone lack of ossification, we just don't know. But you can literally imagine him almost rotating off of the axis of those carpal bones going from valgus to varus, valgus to varus, and just chewing up those sensitive tissues in there. Could this have something to do with, with intrauterine positioning? Could it be related to an imbalance of nutrition or trace minerals? Um, sometimes we don't always know what causes. Um, there's things that are implicated. So when we have incomplete ossification or if we have severe uh, laxities, generally these are the guys that need truly some conservative rest. They may need splints or casts. Uh, we see kind of moldable material. I, don't, I had a broken finger a while ago and it was the kind of material that you just warmed up in the microwave, they molded it to your hand. Uh, the thing with cast splints is we need to be very careful about cast sores. Um, we also know that the, that the sooner we can get them moving without damaging those joints, the better that will be. Otherwise they get almost like spaghetti, uh, very, very weak in their soft tissues. Uh, so sometimes we'll put casts on at night, take them off during the day, et cetera. Um, these little guys are restricted in terms of their exercise because again, we can't have them damaging those sensitive structures. Uh, photobiomodulation, so cold laser, far infrared, uh, both of those certainly will add energy to and oxygen to those bones and support their ossification. I haven't seen anything specifically in terms of those studies, but again, we're looking at an understanding of what does cold laser do? What does far infrared therapy do? And we can extrapolate that to other, other lesions, other wounds, other, other, other issues. I have a similar question about PEMF. We know that PEMF can affect the osteoclastic, osteoblastic activity, and those are the cells that, that do build bone, um, so something to consider. Certainly kinesiology tape, again, promoting circulation, vascular supply. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about kinesiology tape and other applications as well. You see ozone with a question mark because again, when I read some of the literature for ozone and other applications, would not highly rich oxygenated blood to those structures be beneficial? I don't know. So sometimes we ask questions and sometimes we get to, we get to use these or try these therapies. If we are first doing no harm, um, I don't think we have anything to lose until we can get some more research. And nutraceutical support. So, you know, really making sure that these guys have, you know, anti-inflammatory fatty acids, good quality protein, um, that they have maybe herbs, hyaluronic acid, we can look at other things that can support and develop joint health. So we also have causes of angular limb deformity, which are developmental factors, meaning maybe this foal is born straight, uh, straight and, and straight and beautiful that way, um, but over time they develop. So these can be attributed to nutritional imbalances, they could be attributed to excessive exercise or some kind of injury at pasture. Um, usually when we have an injury, these are the horses that are going to damage through the growth plate. So again, just to orientate you, this is a closer up view still of that carpus. So you can see the cannon bone is down here. All of these little spaces here, these are these cuboidal bones that are the really important shock absorbers. And you can see here, this is the distal radius. And again, here's our growth plate. So we can see, just for your own kind of information, you can see in this two month old foal, it's really quite a clear, what we call lucent kind of gray black line. And as this foal is starting to get older into the nine months, we can start to see that this growth plate is closing. Um, 
And this is, this is important just to, we'll come to in terms of if we're going to intervene, we need to intervene while growth plates are open. So timing is important. Uh, so in these developmental factors which cause ALD, there's been some damage to this growth plate and often it's been unequal. Sometimes we'll see a horse that has had damage to one growth plate and not the other and you could potentially have a limb length disparity. But most often what happens is one, one side of this growth plate may become inflamed or have trauma or microfractures or truly a growth plate fracture and what happens is that you have unequal growth from one side to the other. The other time that we can definitely see angular limb deformities develop is as a result to compensation. So unequal weight bearing. And we have a beautiful little horse that I saw at the clinic not so long ago, well, before COVID, so I guess we're on a few months now. Um, but this horse had a very bad tendon injury to uh, his right front leg. And now his left front leg is, is I mean, it's really in a bad way. He has angular limb deformities and flexural issues. Um, and there was nothing wrong with either leg. He was a young horse who was injured and he wasn't able to weight bear evenly. So just to give you an idea, when we, when we look at this growth plate anatomy, so I want you to imagine this is right here, this is that light colored line. And this is where we start to have this transition. And you can just imagine all these teeny little blood vessels growing, converting this cartilage to bone, essentially. And, you know, when we talk about bone, we sometimes think of this really hard structure. But the truth is bone is, is really a living tissue and it responds to force and it has an excessive amount of force beyond which we start crushing and damaging these little cells. Um, and those implications can be quite, quite significant. So just giving you a rough idea of, of the growth plate closures, and this is, comes back to you know, that timeliness in terms of seeing the full, A, we wanna make sure that running around isn't gonna damage if he has or she has any unformed, unossified bones. But further, if we delay intervention, we may run out of an opportunity to direct that growth. So it's not like a tree that continues to grow and I can keep pruning it and shaping it and molding it. We only have a certain amount of time to deal with these angular limb deformities before you just have a crooked tree. Um, so with our distal cannon bones, this is getting into the fetlock joint, those growth plates are closed within six by, by six months. And so if you ever have a foal that has an abnormality in an ankle or a fetlock, we gotta be cracking on these things ASAP. And what I mean by that is if surgical intervention is required, we literally need to be having that surgery done by about three months because now we need to manipulate that growth for the next three months potentially. We repair that at five months, we usually maybe only have about a month to, to manipulate the growth, so to speak. So hawks, uh, close later than fetlocks and radiuses close last, so front legs. But this is when they close. There's a period of really accelerated growth, growth where we have the most opportunity to effectuate the most change. So just highlighting this again, this concavity and convexity, and there'll be a different treatment for each side. So again, this is this most common um, deviation that we talk about. So we come down from our radius and we go lateral. This is a carpal valgus. I think this full, this is not my photo. It looks like he has been, he has been uh, shaved and I actually wonder if he hasn't had surgery just from that. So we'll, we'll see about surgery. So surgery is the gold standard still in severe cases. And there's two approaches to surgery. One is what we refer to as a periosteal release or a periosteal um, transection. And it happens on the concave side. So just coming back, this is the site of periosteal release. This is the site of periosteal release. So essentially what we do is we go in, make a little incision. I say we, I used to do these, Ryan and Dr. Shoemaker and Dr. Sanchez do uh, most all really of our surgeries uh, at Delaney. Uh, but so we would go in, identify the periosteum. So that's that 
tissue that's closest to bone and periosteum is important for blood supply. Uh, and when we go in there and we release it or we transect it, we cut it in half, it releases pressure. Maybe it was holding there and it stimulates growth factors. And so it actually accelerates growth. So if we come back and we look at this little guy again, so we're gonna cut here. And what happens is we speed up this side of growth and maybe then he has a chance to get straight. Now, very often though, this periosteal release, depending again on the degrees of deviation, if you have a rehab, it's, if you have a surgeon, all of these things kind of move through and you see what options are available. But these are the ones that more than 20% of a deviation we believe will end up with surgery. So in addition to doing that periosteal stripping, we can also do a surgery that's referred to as transfazeal bridging. Now I refer to it as a growth plate. Here it is again. Here we are in the same carpal view head on and we can see the radius and this is the growth plate, also known as the physis. And so if we look at the word transfazeal bridging, I'm making a bridge on this side. It's actually kind of like my mom used to say to me when I was growing, she said, I'm gonna put bricks on your head and your feet so you can't grow. So I'm gonna confine this in this space. And essentially that's exactly what we do. So we take two screws and we put one above the physis, one below the physis, and we bridge it. And this is what we call cerclage wire and we, we tighten this down. And essentially that's like putting a vice here. It says, no, you aren't gonna get to grow anymore. I'm not gonna let you spread apart. I'm gonna let this guy grow and catch up. Now, over time, the surgeons have, you know, developed other techniques. They used to use staples, one on this side, one on this side. Um, I saw when I was reviewing Dr. Sanchez's talk, he's, he's not a fan. Uh, we also have this one screw technique that was, pioneered in the early 2000s, right about the time when I thought I wanted to be a surgeon. And instead of two screws, we would just put one screw at an angle across the joint again. And so this, just to orientate you, uh, is a fetlock. And you can see again here, so this is a cannon bone. Again, this gray line is the growth plate or the physis. We can also see, this is our long pastern bone. We can also see the physis here. And we can see this is a varus abnormality because you can see it's going towards the midline. And you can also see that we've corrected on the outside of the joint as opposed to on the inside of the joint with these horses. So when we talk about surgery, um, the things that we should consider and bear in mind are that surgery requires a general anesthetic. Uh, typically, we have additional pain management. Um, there are potential complications and the most likely probably infection. Um, there is a cost consideration because generally there's two procedures which are required because these need to come out. We only want to leave these implants in until the leg is straightened. And I, I have seen in their reports of horses where they just don't go back and all of a sudden this lateral valgus turns into a medial varus because this side overgrows now and we haven't removed the hardware. So it's a consideration in terms of surgery. You're generally looking at two procedures. Um, there's some concern or question that we may induce a fasciitis. So again, you can see we are above and below that growth plate but we are going in and doing surgery and dropping hardware in there, do we create any inflammation? Um, potentially some permanent cosmetic changes depending on where you and your horse intend to go and the possibility for overcorrection, of course, if you're not diligent in having that removed. So additional uh, or conservative supports, certainly trimming. Um, I found a lot of these foals will just resolve with a little bit of preferential trimming. So what we want to look at, we're going to go back to this valgus picture right here. If you can imagine this inside of the foot is what is being driven down hard and most of our weight is being borne on the medial aspect. And what we want to do is preferentially, we want to just a few swipes with our rasp, take this outside wall lower. You want it to have a slight medial lateral imbalance with the lateral wall being shorter. So if you imagine your lateral wall is shorter, it almost has to roll or reach to get to the ground. So it will effectively help in the straightening. So it would be the different application for 
the varus you would trim on the medial aspect preferentially. We can also look at extensions. And so this shoe just has an extension on the lateral aspect. We can see how this foal's leg comes down and varus goes to the inside right at the fetlock. And so this foal may have had surgery as well. But we are also having this, this isn't again my photo, so I'm speculating there. Um, but you can see how we have this lateral edge of the shoe and these shoes are just, are just glued on. So again, um, similar to those lack of ossification folds, we think about nutritional considerations, inflammation, healing, um, just ensuring all of their, their needs are met. So specifically the rehab modalities, which we can incorporate into really any angular limb deformity. Um, and this isn't necessarily it's surgery or rehab. Sometimes maybe it's just rehab. Sometimes it's rehab and surgery. Um, so one thing I learned today, well, I learned a few things today, um, but I had not heard of shockwave being used uh, in these angular limb deformities. And so there's evidence and there was a paper published in 2009. See, you know, you just can't read everything that comes out all the time. But a paper published in 2009 in Vet Ortho Surgery, and they detailed a report of shockwave slowing growth by one, one degree correction per week. So if we think about the side that grows too quickly, we are going to shockwave it. Uh, they believe it creates some degree of inflammation and slows down the growth. Now again, I haven't seen literature specifically, and maybe at some point Penny can, can chime in. Um, I won't be able to hear her, you all will, but uh, photobiomodulation or laser and again far infrared. So we are evoking, we are, we're evoking uh, greater blood flow uh, to that area. And so in general, if we have greater, greater blood flow, can we promote growth that way? So somewhat speculative, but I think well-founded. Um, in general, the laser is also very good at the inflammation. So this is something I am like super excited about um, because if many of you or any of you have tuned into our, any of our previous talks, you know, I love kinesiology tape. And when I first found it about, well, gosh, it's almost 10 years ago now, I knew that was a modality for me. So I had an opportunity today to review a phenomenal webinar by this lady here, Solange Mikai from Brazil. She is a veterinarian uh, and she has a specialty with the American College of Veterinary Sports Medicine and Rehab. And she came across an article in 2015 that talked about creating toe valgus in people using kinesiology tape. And I, I guess this is kind of the whole ultimate uh, collaboration happening at Delaney is bringing these rehab principles in. So literally we're looking at human toe abnormalities to really offer incredible insight into an opportunity for full mm -hmm. abnormalities. So for those of you who may not be familiar with kinesiology tape, it's tape that we apply on the skin that has an inherent recoil to it. And it works via these sensory receptors in the skin. And there's numerous kinds, and I know you, you can't see them and you don't need to see them, but what I want to give you an impression of is that there are specialized cell in every inch of skin that give feedback to the nervous system. So the same way that obviously we all see a, a fly on our horses behind and they feel it, the tape evokes similar proprioceptive neurological feedback. So Dr. Solange and her team and we're looking at these angular limb folds, looking at this 2015 article, and they thought, well, what do we have to lose? They thought, what if we apply the tape on the convex side with about a 30% stretch applied over the treatment area? So again, for those of you who aren't familiar with kinesiology tape, you can um, get the Coles notes today, but you could also email us at the rehab email and we can give you the YouTube link to the webinar on kinesiology tape. So the premise of the K-tape is that depending on the degree of stretch inherent in the fiber and the direction of recoil, uh, we can achieve different effects. So the stretch percentage, the tensile strength in this case was chosen to be 30%. 
So their hypothesis for the mechanism of action comes down to a very dense concentration of nerve receptors in something we call the carpal retinaculum. It's a big word, it happens to be one of my favorite. Um, but this sheet right here is the carpal retinaculum. And so I want you in your mind's eye, I want you to imagine under this all those little carpal bones. And all of these up here, those four limb muscles, and these are all the tendons that come down and extend or on the back flex that carpal joint. So the carpal retinaculum's job is to keep everybody's pulley, everybody's tendon running straight over that joint so that it can either extend or flex the joint as needed. The carpal retinaculum is so innervated because if anyone has ever had that moment where you think you're going to roll your ankle, it has these stretch receptors. And so it's highly innervated. And we also have the skin there as well, the kinesio tape may be working on. So essentially the reason they think they're having the results they are, I'm going to show you two cases that they shared, um, but the reason they think they're having the results that they are is mediated through fascia, essentially, which is what this carpal retinaculum is. And the really interesting thing, and I, and I really want to acknowledge this, is that the kinesio tape is working because it's changing proprioception in the area. It's not changing because it's acting like a splint or a support. This is a neurological intervention. Now, it's interesting because, again, we go back to intervention and timing. So maybe your foal is only two or three weeks old. If you can get kinesiology tape on there very early, you may support that spontaneous correction. And I think, to me, that's almost like prevention. So I want to share with you uh, two of the cases that they presented. So this may be a little bit difficult to see. It's a screenshot of her webinar, and you can see here the, the credit to them. Um, so this is case one. This is a 30-day-old Mangalar filly, and so this must be, I'm going to plead total ignorance. I'm assuming this is a, a native uh, Brazilian breed. So filly with a carpal vagus of her right forelimb. So we can see on day zero, so they have a little bit of a different measurement. So I'm just going to draw attention to this. You can see here they have a reference of 150 degrees. So now what they are measuring is this angle, saying that it should be 180, which is straight. Whereas we, by convention, measure this angle from the plane of straightness here, where it intersects here. And if you look, this is 27 degrees. Now, this is a case report. This is not a blinded clinical trial where we might say, I'd like to see a radiograph. How is it standing for, you know? So there may be some margin of error, but we are still talking about a significant valgus. And we can see here on the convex side, they've applied one piece just above, and just below. And over this treatment area here, they've applied 30% tension and they've applied these circumferential little tapes that really just hold this guy in place. So day zero, day five, we are now, in their words, 165 degrees. So that is an improvement of more than 13 degrees, is my math, seven, five, 12, right? 10 days later, we're 171. At 15 days, you're 180 degrees, you're straight. And so, I mean, when she presented this case, the first time I saw this research, I, I, I got excited, um, frankly. This is her second case. So this is a 60-day-old quarter horse uh, with a carpal valgus in his left, left forelimb. So you can see him here on day zero, and his angle is 162 degrees. Now, this is, I thought, a very interesting story when she said it. This foal actually came to the vet school to have transficeal bridging and a periosteal stripping. However, they detected concurrent disease. He was sick and I don't know specifically what he had, but they felt that surgical intervention at that point was not an appropriate therapy. Now, again, because remember the growth plate here isn't gonna close for a while. He's only 60 days, we got months. They said, you know what, let's get him, get over his illness and then we'll do surgery. In the meantime, Dr. Solange's resident happened to be on clinics and she said, let me just put kinesiology tape on that thing while it gets better. Well, day five, we had improved by four degrees. 
day 10, he's now 170, I can't see that, 170 something degrees. By day 15, two weeks later, he's three degrees from straight. He didn't have to have his surgery. So I think it's a very interesting, and I think it's, well, we need to take it for what it is, and they are case reports. And so they are published case reports. So she was able to publish them uh, last year in um, a rehab journal and presented it uh, at the symposium on veterinary rehab and physiotherapy. Um, they are now working on collecting data for a larger trial. So we talk about having enough, having enough patients to know that it's statistically significant. So that's what the N means here. That's the number of participants is 60. They want 60 horses. But what I found really fascinating about the design that they're proposing for this study is that the foals have to have bilateral carpal valgus. And so both of their front legs need to have that turned out splay foot appearance and what they are doing and this is what i think is very ingenious is they're only treating one leg at a time and allowing the other as a control because again we have months to fix these foals so we get them in at a period of weeks or months couple months they treat one leg it straightens they treat the other leg it straightens so so far they've had 20 horses move through the program or through that be included into the study and every one of them have straightened with only the kinesiology tape now i don't know the degrees of deviation but we can certainly see if those two case reports are anything i go back to my very first comment our current belief is, and I don't know if that can evolve or not, I'm not sure. So in general, kinesiology taping may emerge uh, as really the gold standard. Um, currently, it's definitely a very promising consideration in terms of non-invasive therapy. There certainly are less risks, general anesthetic, overcorrection. It allows any concurrent illness to be dealt with. It certainly is inexpensive and it's easily performed. So when I had this education today about the kinesiology tape and how we believe the mechanism of action for helping straighten is basically a manipulation of the nervous system, I started thinking about our surefoot pads. Uh, as many of you may know, um, Penny, my cohort in the rehab department, has sought out this product and uh, recently offered her own perspectives with the company founder, Wendy. You can tune into that webinar or also the webinar she did uh, as part of our Wellness Wednesdays if you want to learn more about Surefoot Pads in general. But these also work based on proprioceptive feedback. So again, proprioceptive feedback are these specialized nerve cells and endings that are in our skin, that are in our fascia, that are also in feet. And so I wonder, can we offer additional proprioceptive feedbacks that could be helpful? And I even wonder specifically with the slant pads, can we slant the horses or can we offer them as penny says we don't get to do the horses get to choose with surefoots but i'm curious how the foals might choose to stand on these i'm curious what effects they could have and because my little curiousness incorporates my frontal cortex i wonder about the tmj and the stomatonathic system so this is how essentially the jaw masseter muscle tension in there can actually affect the way the front feet fall so not to go too much further down that rabbit hole um, but just to think in so far as what other things could be evolving um, flexural limb deformities uh, we'll touch on these um, and then we'll take a few questions i can see there's been some on the chat i'll figure out how to hear penny or she can i'll read them whatever uh, so flexural deformities tend to be uh, soft tissue, not bone, um, and we typically either have kind of this idea of the shortening of the musculotendinous structures resulting in this hyperflexion. So you can almost get the idea here that the bones are too long and the soft tissues just haven't caught up. So this 
hyperflexion can happen in the carpus. If you remember the very beginning, the little donkey, he had a fetlock hyperflexion. And some of you may have seen a hyperextension. So a laxity in the soft tissues, these toes are up, the fetlocks are dropped. Um, this little guy might have difficulty ambulating with flaccid muscles. Um, you can see we've protected him here from knuckling over and have kinesiology taped him behind. So most often these flexural abnormalities, if they're congenital, or they're truly multifactorial. And sometimes I think the multifactorial should be, we don't really know, um, but many things can, can contribute. And so there have been hypotheses, intrauterine positioning, uh, diseases of the mare during pregnancy, gene mutations, enzyme deficiencies, and Certainly, Dr. Sanchez uh, went into a little bit more detail about some of these. I want to focus a little bit more on the rehab component, but um, perhaps he'll make his talk available. If, just like with angular limb deformities, with these flexural abnormalities, the causes can also be acquired. Um, so developmental or orthopedic disease. So this may be a, an OCD or an angular limb deformity, it might be pain. It may be that rapid growth or diet, right? So the kind of the objective measurement. So again, we're going to test, we're going to do a very similar workup irrespective um, if we have an ALD or an angular limb deformity or sorry, a flexural abnormality. But kind of the gold standard that we look at in terms of objective measurements is what we refer to as goniometry. And this is a measurement of the joint angle. And so we do this in a weighted position and a not weighted or an unweighted position. Um, so we can, again, have a way to know that our therapy has been effective. So therapies really depend on the condition. Obviously, if it's a hyperflexion versus a hyperextension, uh, there'll be very different approaches. Uh, in all folds, and we'll say it here again, pain and ulcer management is key. So sometimes with these hyperflexed or what we would call contracted folds, sometimes we would give them oxytetracycline. Um, the hypothesis was that it maybe bound calcium and allowed a certain laxity. It's something that we know uh, only works when they're quite young and potentially it can have uh, side effects on the kidney. Uh, we still sometimes will use splints and casts depending on what is happening. And these are used again with caution. More and more we know that early mobilization is best. Um, but we can use bandaging, certainly if they're open wounds, we'll see lots of these folds that will have developed wounds either on the back or front of their fetlock, so bandaging, different podiatry interventions. So you can see this is a foal that has just had an acrylic or a, a gel applied to create a trailer to change the forces to try to support uh, that fetlock joint. So again, with these, with these uh, laxities, controlled exercise. So some paddock turnout, maybe some swimming if you have it available. General postural supports and core development. Uh, I think it's something that really you know, merits just a moment is that although it is a limb, uh, that limb is connected to a body. And the better that body can have the most functional posture, the best core, the best aspect, axial skeleton, um, the less stress will be on the rest of those limbs. Manual stretching is definitely helpful for these guys. Um, and I find it's best when we've done some work to warm up the fascia or the tissue. So maybe in conjunction with other manual modalities, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And similarly with joint mobilization, we just want to try to flex and extend and manipulate these joints. It, it helps the blood flow, it helps clean the joint essentially. If you imagine this, this idea of yoga, right, where you take one pose and then you take another pose. Um, so the joint mobilization is kind of akin in that, in that way. And again, it gets me thinking about the surefoot pads. So as you may or may not know, there are different densities of pad, starting with um, more firm, working up to uh, less firm pads, which less firm pads would allow more stretching 
or more shifting. Uh, so I think that these, I have not had an opportunity because the Surefoots are, are really very new on the market. Um, only in about the last six months has this tool been available. So I can start to see where we may be able to combine some of these tools and helping these foals relax. So again, other treatments, more laser photobiomodulation, so wounds or pain. Working here, and this is kind of this idea, I wanted to, to just have this representation. This is a forelimb. And again, you can see here, this is the carpal retinaculum that's all yellow. And you can see how these muscles come down into this tendon and this tendon inserts lower. Uh, on the limb. So this is where if we have the shortening of this soft tissue here, you can see we may have a flexural abnormality. So massage in here, sweat, stretching, movement, um, again, other manual modalities, acupuncture, cranial sacral, myofascial release, chiropractic. Um, they were talking about neuroelectromagnetic neuroelectro stimulation today um, in terms of releasing the tension in these muscles. And then again, of course, kinesiology taping. So we saw that bowl that had the real laxity what we do with this foal is again we're going to lay this kinesio tape down all the way here and we're going to support that flexor tendon in doing its job now if the foal for example had this hyperflexion we could actually do the opposite we would tape this way to help release this so for flexural deformities kinesiology tape uh, also has certainly a place and I suspect after listening to what uh, the folks in Brazil are doing with the angular limb deformities and kinesiology taping that it won't be long before they are doing some um, flexural deformity kinesiology tape as well research as well um, that's about it for the rehab perspective for crooked legged foals I just wanted to let you know that our last Wellness Wednesday webinar is coming up uh, next Wednesday, June 24th. We're going to talk about an integrated approach to scratches management. If your horse looks like this, uh, you would like to tune in next week. And any questions? And I think Penny has been texting me questions. Is that what you want me to do, Penny? Oh, she's going to chime in about the laser at the end. Penny, do you want to chime in about the laser first? Hi, can everyone hear me? I'm sorry, my uh, my connection wasn't great, and I think I blocked out for a bit there. Uh, if you can't hear me, let me know. <laughs> Don't know how you do that, but anyway. Um, so I wanted to, thanks, Connie. Uh, I wanted to just give you an overview of the, view of the, of the photobiomodulation, which we previously referred to as cold laser therapy. And basically what uh, we can use it to actually reduce that fasciitis, so the, the inflammation in the growth plates. Um, so even in a, in a normal um, straight leg where they've had maybe a trauma and there's swelling and, and um, inflammation in the joint, we can use the laser to reduce that inflammation, but we don't want to overdo it we want to do just just enough to con control the, the swelling and then we will um, leave it alone and let it be um, if we want to promote growth to one side then we may stimulate it with the laser to on that side that we're trying to promote the growth because the idea is that when we accelerate um, blood flow to the area we are um, accelerating the healing process so if you know, we don't want to create an angular de limb deformity by accelerating one side or the other. We, we only want to kind of target the areas that need it or avoid the ones that don't. So I hopefully that, that clarifies things a little bit. Uh, so I'm just going to go, I think what I'll do, because I think Jody can hear us, no, except me. <laughs> so I'm going to, uh, my questions have disappeared. So you know what, I'm going to just text her and let her know that. Oh, you're texting. I see Penny texting me. <laughs> Loved you. Um, okay. 
Hopefully she can get these questions from you. I know we had a couple of My them. chat disappeared. Okay. Penny's chat disappeared. So I look at the questions. I can't hear you. So you'll just, I'm going to go through the chat and I'll answer the questions. Okay. Um, uh, Tammy, with the use of tape, are the folds kept relatively immobile? So I, I guess, Tammy, are you, what kind, why are we taping? Do we have an angular limb deformity from a growth plate or do we have a delayed ossification in the carpal bones? Most of these foals are, have some degree of um, exercise, controlled exercise. So, I mean, not necessarily stall rest, um, but paddock turnout. And you know, it's interesting, the, the researchers in Helsinki were talking about um, what factors create movement on pasture. So things like gender of the foal, little boys tend to rip around the pasture more. Uh, the amount of hours the foals are outside, the foals that are out for a longer time don't tend to rip around as much. Um, so it, it's interesting, they've gone through and it's, it's kind of part of their developmental. So partly it depends maybe, again, why your foal is taped, what age they're at, what else could be happening. I don't know if that's, it's individual. There's definitely usually some controlled exercise. Um, and then Tammy said, would an underbite in a foal contribute to limb deformity? So it's a very interesting question. Um, and I guess the thing is, I don't know the answer to that. Having said that though, when we tend to see um, bradynaphism, so changes in the jaw symmetry, is it associated with one of these, what we call dismature, malmature, hypothyroid foals? And so what I wonder is if there isn't a unifying condition in that, insofar as if that foal has an underbite, um, is there another, kind of maladjustment syndrome that could be happening there. I don't know if that answered your question. Rob, why on a foal with contracted tendons would you use a tape on the front of the knee instead of behind the knee? So Rob, that has to do with the tape having an inherent recoil. So when we are trying to facilitate or support a tendon, like in that foal that was really lax, we want to mimic the path of the muscle and the tendon. So we want to go from the origin of the muscle to the insertion of the tendon, and we want to tape in that direction. And when we do that, we're supporting that tendon. So now a horse with contracted tendons that might be um, coming over, so the extensor tendon is essentially what we want to inhibit. And so in order to inhibit that tendon, we need to tape from insertion to origin. So we would tape from the bottom up to the front. So wait, hang on, Rob. Are you talking, wait, we should, I know Penny's laughing because which contracted tendon? So I guess we should say, is it a contracted flexor tendon or contracted extensor tendon? If it's a contracted flexor tendon, I would still tape behind the knee, but I would tape in the opposite way. I would tape from insertion to origin. I had a picture on my slide. Okay, let me go back to it. Maybe I can go back to it. Uh-oh, I just lost my talk. Oh, there it is. Okay, hang on. I'm thinking, you are thinking, are you thinking this one, Rob? Yes, okay, thank you. Okay, so I don't know what I said, but if I was taping this foal, I would facilitate the extensor tendon. So I need this Goal to extend its hyperflexed. So on the front, I would take from the origin of the muscle down to the insertion of the extensor. And I typically tape right to the coronary band. So this is going to have that effect of kind of pulling it forward. On the back of this leg, 
These are all tight, so I need to release them. So I'm gonna tape from insertion up this way to origin. So you can apply the tape to both the front and the back of the leg, depending on what we want that muscle to do or that ligament to do. Do we wanna support it or do we wanna release it? I hope that answers your question. Okay, hang on, this is Rob. Yes, thank you. Sorry if I said it wrong before. Anyone else have any questions, comments, feedback? You'll have to type because I can't hear. This is maybe what it's like in my daughter's world. I keep talking, but I don't know if she hears me. Okay, well, if there are no other questions or comments, um, I just want to thank everybody so much for attending. Um, I wish I could, Kellyanne, you can send a picture. We, uh, one of the things with the rehab department is uh, we do a lot of telemedicine. We do a lot of distance work. Um, so a picture is a start, um, but I do need to emphasize, and this is, you know, the radiographs can be a very, very important part. Um, you did send to the email, good work, Kelly. And so if anybody has, um, Thanks, Rob. Great topic. Thank you. I enjoyed it too. If anybody has any uh, other inquiries about the rehab department or just in general, you can always email us at rehab um, at delaneyvetservices.com. We would love to chat with you, Penny and I, and uh, we're really glad you guys came in today. So thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Connie. Take care. Tammy, you're welcome. Penny, whenever you're ready. Thanks so much, everyone. Enjoy your evening.